That's not wild. My percept is that it fits. I got another road, and when I overlay the two, one of them is certainly wild. I blanked. What road is that? The one we got in the TSI brochure about the places and things we would be visiting. All about Earth and humans, how it got started, what it's for, all that stuff. I closed, then opened slowly. They don't match up? Here, get your own percept. B.B. tossed a road at me, and I took it curiously, and unfolded it. Click. Someone, somewhere, or both, in millions or uncountable, requires, likes, needs, values, collects, drinks, eats, or uses as a drug, a substance, ident louche. Electricity, oil, oxygen, gold, wheat, water, land, old coins, uranium. This is a rare substance in somewhere, and those who possess louche find it vital for whatever it is used for. Faced with this question of supply and demand, a universal law of somewhere, Someone decided to produce it artificially, so to speak, rather than search for it in its natural form. He decided to build a garden and grow louche. In the natural state, louche was found to originate from a series of vibrational actions in the carbon-oxygen cycle, and the residue was louche in varying degrees of purity. It occurred only during such action and secondarily during the reactive process. Prospectors from somewhere ranged far and wide in search of louche sources, and new discoveries were hailed with much enthusiasm and reward. So it was that someone and his garden changed all this. Far off in a remote area, he set to work on his experiment. First, he created a proper environment for the carbon-oxygen cycle where it would flourish. He created a balance with much care so that proper radiation and other nourishment would be in continuous supply. He then tried his first crop, which actually did produce louche, but only in small quantities and of comparatively low grade, not significant enough to take back to the heart of somewhere. The problem was twofold. The life period was too short, and the crop units themselves were too minute. This brought about limits in quality and quantity, as the crop had no time to generate louche in such close tolerances. Moreover, the louche could be harvested only at the moment of termination of the lifespan, not one moment before. His second crop was no better, if as good. He changed the environment to another part of the garden where the density was gaseous rather than liquid, and the higher density chemicals formed a solid base and thus were still available. He planted numberless units in many varieties in a new form, with a great increase in size, some many thousands of times larger and more complex than the simple unicellular first crop. He reversed the carbon-oxygen cycle. Yet all had a basic uniformity. Like the first crop, they would reseed at regular intervals and terminate their lifespans automatically. To avoid the uneven distribution of chemicals and radiation which had been prevalent in the first crop, he immobilized the second crop. Each was designed to stay principally in its own section of the garden. To this end, each was given firm tendrils which burrowed deep into the more dense chemical matter. Attached to this was a stem or trunk which helped elevate the upper portion upward for its share of needed radiation. The upper portion, broad, thin, and somewhat fragile, was designed as a transducer of carbon-oxygen compounds to and from the crop unit. As an added thought, brilliant color radiators accompanied by small particle generators were mounted on each unit, usually near the top and symmetrically centered. He set up circulating patterns in the gaseous envelope around the crop, principally to aid in the reseeding process. Later he discovered that the same turbulent effect served as a means of harvesting the louche. If the turbulence were violent enough, the crop would be blown down, the lifespan terminated, and the louche would discharge. This was especially useful when an immediate louche supply was desired at a particular point rather than at harvest time. Despite all of this, the second crop was most unsatisfactory. While it was true that a much greater quantity was attained, the unrefined louche produced was of such low grade that it was scarcely worth the effort. In addition, the growth period was now too long and no increase in quality resulted. Some vital element was missing. Someone hovered over his garden for a long period in study before he attempted the third crop. It was indeed a challenge. True, he was partially successful. He had grown louche. Yet the product of his efforts fell far short of the wild, uncultivated variety. It was inevitable that he perceived the answer. The third crop was living proof of this truth. The original carbon-oxygen cycle must be included. Mobility must be restored. Both factors had shown great promise in high-grade louche production. If size could be added to this, much could be accomplished. With this plan in the forefront, 
Someone removed various sample units from the first crop, which was still thriving in the liquid portion of the garden. He modified them to exist and grow in the gaseous area. He adapted them first to take nourishment from the second crop, which he permitted to abound for this very purpose. Thus it was that the first of the mobiles, the third crop, came into being. The mobiles took nourishment from the second crop, thus ending its lifespan and producing low-grade louche. When each huge mobile terminated its own lifespan, additional louche was produced. The quantity was massive, but the frequency pattern of the louche residue still left much to be desired. It was by accident that someone came upon the prime catalyst as regards louche production. The monstrous and slow-moving mobiles had a lifespan far out of proportion to their nourishment input. The growth and life termination process was of such length that soon the mobiles would all but decimate the second crop. The entire garden would be out of balance, and there would be no louche production whatsoever. Both the second and third crop faced extinction. As the second crop grew scarce, energy needs of the mobiles became acute. Often two mobiles would seek to ingest the identical second crop unit. This created conflict, which resulted in physical struggle among two or more of the ungainly mobiles. Someone observed these struggles, at first bemused with the problem, then with great interest. As the struggles ensued, the mobiles were emanating louche. Not in fractional amounts, but in sizable, usable quantities and of a much higher purity. He quickly put the theory to the test. He removed another unit of first crop from the liquid garden area, redesigned it for the gaseous environment, but with one significant change. The new mobile would be somewhat smaller, but would require the ingestion of other mobiles for nourishment. This would solve the problem of overpopulation of mobiles, and at the same time would create good quantities of usable louche during each conflict struggle, plus a bonus if the new class of mobile terminated the lifespan of the other. Someone would be able to transmit to somewhere practical amounts of reasonably pure louche. Thus it was that the rule of the prime catalyst came into being. Conflict among carbon-oxygen cycle units brings forth consistent emanations of louche. It was as simple as that. Satisfied that he had found the formula, someone prepared the fourth crop. He now knew that the third crop mobiles were too large and too long in lifespan to be ultimately practical. If grown in large numbers, the entire garden would have to be expanded and enlarged. There was not space enough to grow such massive single units and the proportionate leafy second crops to support them. Also, he reasoned correctly that more rapid and increased mobility would expand the conflict factor with the resultant higher loose output. In one single motion, someone terminated the lifespans of all the lumbering third crop mobiles. Going back to the first crop in the liquid area, he modified and expanded them into a multitude of shapes and sizes, gave them complex multicellular structures of high mobility. He designed them into a pattern of balance. There were those that ingested a second crop type of carbon cycle unit, basically immobile, as an energy source. There were others, very highly mobile, who required for energy the ingestion of other mobile modified first crop units. The completed circuit operated quite satisfactorily. The stationary second crop modification in the liquid environment flourished. Small, highly active liquid breathing mobiles took nourishment, ate the second crop modification. Larger and or other active mobiles consumed for energy the smaller plant eaters. When any mobile grew too large and slow, it became an easy target for the smaller mobiles who attacked in voracious numbers. The chemical residue from these ingestive actions settled to the bottom of the liquid medium and so provided new nourishment for the stationaries, modified second crop, completing the circuit. The result was a steady flow of louche from the lifespan termination of the stationaries, from the intense conflict among the mobiles to avoid ingestion, and finally from the sudden termination of the lifespans of such mobiles as the inevitable product of such conflicts. Turning to another portion of his garden, the gaseous area with a dense compound base, someone applied the same techniques with even more advanced improvements. He added many varieties of stationaries, original second crop, to provide sufficient and diverse nourishment for the new mobiles he was to create. As in the other garden area, he made such mobiles into a balance of two species, those who ingested and drew energy from the second crop stationaries, and those who required other mobiles for sustenance. He created them in literally thousands of original types, small, large, yet none so large as the third crop mobiles, and ingeniously gave each some appurtenance for conflict. These took the form of mass, elusive speed, deceptive and or protective coating and or color radiation, wave action and particle perceptors and detectors, 
and unique, higher-density protuberances for gouging, grasping, and rending during conflict. All of the latter serve neatly to add to and prolong the conflict periods, with the resultant increase in louche emanation. As a side experiment, someone designed and created one form of mobile that was weak and ineffective by the standards of the other mobiles in the fourth crop. Yet this experimental mobile had two distinct advantages. It had the ability to ingest and take energy from both the stationaries and other mobiles. Second, someone pulled forth a piece of himself, no other source of such substance being known or available, to act as an intensive, ultimate trigger to mobility. Following the rule of attraction, someone knew that such infusion would create in this particular mobile species an unceasing mobility. Always, it would seek to satisfy the attraction this tiny motive himself engendered as it sought reunion with the infinite whole. Thus, the drive for satisfaction of energy requirements through ingestion would not be the only motivating force. More important, the needs and compulsions created by the peace of someone could not be satiated throughout the garden. Thus, the need for mobility would be ever-present, and the conflict between this need and that of energy replacement would be constant, possibly a continuous, high-order louche emanator if it survived. The fourth crop exceeded all of someone's expectations. It became apparent that a consistent, useful flow of louche was being produced in the garden. The balance of life operated perfectly, with the conflict factor producing immense amounts of louche and a steady supplement brought into being by the constant lifespan terminations from all types of mobiles and stationaries. To handle the output, someone set up special collectors to aid in the harvest. He set up channels to convey the raw louche from his garden to somewhere. No longer did somewhere depend principally upon the wild state as the principal source of louche. The garden of someone had ended that. With the success of the garden and the production of louche by cultivated means, others began to design and build their gardens. This was in accordance with the law of supply and demand. Vacuum is an unstable condition, as the amounts of louche from someone's garden only partially met the requirements of somewhere. Collectors, on behalf of the others, actually entered the garden of someone to take advantage of those small emanations of louche overlooked or ignored by the collectors of someone. Someone, his work completed, returned to somewhere and occupied himself with other matters. Louche production stayed at a constant level under the supervision of the collectors. The only alterations were ordered by someone himself. Under instructions from someone, the collectors periodically harvested segments of the fourth crop. This was done to ensure adequate chemicals, radiation, and other nourishment for the younger oncoming units. A secondary purpose was to provide occasional extra amounts of louche created by such harvesting. To reap such harvest, the collectors generated storms of turbulence and turmoil in both the gaseous envelope and the more solid chemical formations that were the base of the garden itself. Such upheavals had the effect of terminating lifespans of multitudes of the fourth crop as they were crushed under the rolling base formation or smothered under waves from the agitated liquid area of the garden. By peculiarity of design, fourth crop units could not maintain their carbon-oxygen cycle surrounded by the liquid medium. The garden pattern of life might have gone on thus throughout eternity, had it not been for the perception and inquisitiveness of someone. On occasion he would study samples of louche from his garden. There was no motive in doing so other than the fact that someone may have held a remote continuing interest in his project. On a particular analysis of a louche sample, someone had casually examined the emanations and was about to return it to the reservoir when he became aware of a difference. It was very slight, but there it was. His interest centered immediately, he looked again. Woven delicately in with the more common louche emanations was a slender fragment of purified and distilled louche. This was an impossibility. Purified and distilled louche resulted only after the wild state louche had been processed many times. The louche from the garden of someone required the same treatment before it could be used. Yet here it was, so finely graded in its refined radiations that it could or would not return into compound with the raw substance. Someone reaffirmed his tests, and the result was still positive. There was a factor in his garden of which he was unaware. Quickly, someone left somewhere and returned to his garden. Outwardly, all seemed the same. The solid base gaseous areas of the garden were an endless carpet of green reflection from the thriving second crop. The modified first crop in the liquid area was in perfect accord with the action-reaction law, a division of cause and effect. Someone perceived without delay that the difference, the source of distilled louche, lay neither with the first nor with the second crop. 
He found his first momentary touch of distilled louche emanation in one of the units of the fourth crop, which had by then filtered throughout the plantings of the second crop. The flash came during the unusual action of this unit as it entered into a life-terminating struggle with another fourth crop unit. This alone would not create distilled louche, someone knew, and he probed deeper for the source. It was at that moment that he discovered the difference. The fourth crop unit was not struggling in conflict over an ingestible remnant of a weaker fourth crop unit, or a tasty frond from a nearby second crop stem, or to avoid termination of life and ingestion by the other conflicting fourth crop unit. It was in conflict to protect and save from life termination three of its own newly generated species huddled under a large second crop unit waiting for the outcome. There was no doubt about it. This was the action that produced the flashes of distilled louche. With this clue, someone examined the actions of other fourth crop units in the garden. He found similar flashes when other fourth crop units took the same action in defense of their young. Still, there was an inconsistency. The sum of all such flashes of distilled louche emanation from all such actions by the current fourth crop would not amount to half of the total he had found in the sample from the reservoir. It was obvious that another factor was present. Systematically, he hovered over the garden, extending his perception to all areas. Almost immediately, he found the source. High-order distilled louche radiation was originating from one particular section of the garden. Quickly, he hurried to the spot. There it was. An experimental modified fourth crop unit, one of those that contained a piece of himself in its functional pattern. It was standing alone under the leafy upper portion of a large second crop unit. It was not hungry. It was not in conflict with another fourth crop unit. It was not acting in defense of its young. Then why did it emanate distilled louche in such great quantity? Someone moved closer. His perception entered into the modified fourth crop unit, and then he knew. The unit was lonely. It was this effect that produced distilled louche. As someone drew back, he noted another unusual inconsistency. The modified fourth crop unit suddenly had become aware of his presence. It had collapsed and was jerking in strange convulsions on the solid base formation. Clear liquid was being expelled from the two radiation-perceiving orifices. With this, the distilled louche emitted became even more pronounced. It was from this that someone propounded his now famous DLP formula, which is in effect in the garden at this time. The balance of the story is well known. Someone included the fundamental in his formula. The creation of pure distilled louche is brought forth in type 4M units by the action of unfulfillment, but only if such pattern is enacted at a vibratory level above the sensory bounds of the environment. The greater the intensity of said pattern, the greater the output of louche distillate. To put the formula into effect, someone designed subtle changes in his garden, all of them familiar to every historian. The splitting of all crop units into halves to engender loneliness as they sought to reunite, and the encouragement of dominance of the Type 4M units are but two of the most noteworthy innovations. As it appears now, the garden is a fascinating spectacle of efficiency. The collectors have long since become masters at the art of the DLP formula. Type 4M units dominate and have spread throughout the entire garden, with the exception of the deeper portions of the liquid medium. These are the principal producers of louche distillate. From experience, the collectors have evolved an entire technology with supplementary tools for the harvesting of louche from the Type 4M units. The most common have been named love, friendship, family, greed, hate, pain, guilt, disease, pride, ambition, ownership, possession, sacrifice, and on a larger scale, nations, provincialism, wars, famine, religion, machines, freedom, industry, trade, to list a few. Louche production is higher than ever before. Click. I was closed tightly, turned inward, stunned. My first reaction was there had to be some mistake. This was not the story history of Earth. BB had mixed it up with some other port of call on their cruise schedule. Yet as I ran the road again, the overlay of what little I knew of Earth's zoological and human history was uncomfortably accurate, albeit from another perspective. The food chain of Earth's ecobiologic systems had been well established. Knowing this about Mother Nature, some of the hardcore philosophic speculators had often pondered where the human animal fit in the process. The downside was obvious. Who ate us? Before it had been just that, speculation. Now. B.B. opened, plied. You get the percept, Ram? I dulled. 
Yeah, I get it. Well then, B.B. went on, what's Louche got to do with learning? I opened slightly. And you got the rope before you came to Earth. B.B. smoothed. Like I gave you. It was in the TSI cruise brochure. It was in with hundreds of other ropes we got before we left. I opened more, but tightly. Where did the brochure come from? Why, uh, yeah, from the cruise director. Where did he get it? B.B. flickered. I don't have a road on that. He just dumped them on us and rolled. Here's the exciting and interesting stops we'll make on the cruise. I got a good percept because it was the last one we'd visit, so it was the last rope we got. That's why it was so clear. Some of the others are dim because they were in the middle. Not the earth rote or humans. It's all clear, not wild at all. I hardened. And where did the cruise director come from? B.B. lighted. Oh, he and the rest are a bunch of curls from the system next to us. Why did they offer the cruise to you in KT-95? B.B. smoothed. Well, it was sort of a trade. We do it all the time with systems near us. What did they get in trade? B.B. lighted. Games. Games. We got more games than any system four skips in any direction. I turned inward and closed. It was getting too hot to handle. If the rope was real, a huge if. I began to drop off. Anger, the feeling of being on the receiving end of a huge deception. The resentment at being manipulated. Wanting to strike out at those who were conning me. Us, all humans. Who were taking something from us without our consent or permission. What happened to the freedom idea? Was every thought and action we took guided, no, directed and controlled just to produce more louche, whatever that was, for a breakfast table or a fuel tank in a somewhere? And what could I do about it even knowing? I dulled deeply and dropped off more and more. Hey, Ram, B.B. was fading rapidly. Where are you going? Return to the physical was near instantaneous, exactly as if I had pushed the panic button, which I had not done for so long. Strong sense of tiredness, both mental and physical. Neglected to check time of return. Low energy, no desire to do anything. Unable to get to sleep. Got up, went to the kitchen and made a cup of coffee. Sat and stared at the cup. With no energy or desire for exploration during the two weeks following, in a depressed state, the only production that surfaced was... It is sunset. 